Hi. Um, so uh, on Thursday, June 23rd, uh, the Supreme Court issued their first major Second Amendment uh, opinion, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. And on the following Friday, they released Dobbs v. Uh, Jackson Hole Women's Health. And I have been working on these two cases since. And, and beyond sort of putting my uh, therapist in overtime, it's given me a link between these two and thinking about the extent to which the rage, or reproductive justice movement can inform the way we think about Second Amendment rights and, and gun violence moving forward. So uh, just very briefly background, right in 2008, the Supreme Court issues its opinion in District of Columbia v. Heller, where they say for the first time, the Second Amendment uh, protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Importantly, they say uh, what undergirds this right is that of self-defense. But there's language in there that essentially hints at the idea that this right doesn't really belong to everybody, right? And so there's some language about felons, think about who felons tend to uh, uh, be, right? And the mentally ill, but really this language around law-abiding citizens um, is, is this thing that has kind of carried forward from the Heller opinion, right? So we fast forward to Bruin, and really what I wanna highlight here is Bruin has this selective use of race in it, right? Where they uh, cite to the Dred Scott opinion saying, look, um, you know, after the Civil War, they didn't want black people to be free or even before the Civil War. And part of the reason is because they would arm themselves. And, and really after the Civil War, it was the guns that protected them, you know, and protected their community, right? I guess discounting all the lynchings that happened uh, after and into uh, the 20th century. Right, but so that is sort of this selective use. And so thinking about how do these rights actually play out in reality versus in theory, right? The, the Supreme Court tends to work in theory. And so who do these rights protect? How do these rights actually interact? And what do they sort of do for the power and the racial structure that we have? So here we have Lando Castile who uh, is getting pulled over, he says, I, just so you know, officer, I have a firearm in here. I have a permit to carry this firearm, right? And he gets shot and killed. The police officer, um, you know, gets off. Um, and, and so again, thinking about who then really has this right, right? And so importantly, Bruin um, extends Heller by saying, not only do you have this right within the home, but you have this right to carry a firearm in public for self-defense, right? And so again, then we're starting to think about this language that is used here in Bruin. So here in the top left, right, what do we have? We have some people that say, okay, you know what? We're gonna arm ourselves to protect our community, specifically against law enforcement who abuse our community, right? And so these are the Black Panthers. They are in, uh, they arm themselves. They go to the California Capitol. Then Governor Ronald Reagan says, why would anybody need to carry a loaded firearm in public, right? That is just insane. And so we're going to ban this, right? In the state of California, that happens. Let's fast forward. Right now we have Kyle Rittenhouse, who is uh, underage, gets uh, an AR-15, travels across state lines to another state where there is a racial justice protest, goes there allegedly to protect car lots, right? So protecting property, um, ultimately ends up shooting and killing somebody because they, I think, hit him with a skateboard, right? So the extent to which now we potentially have more people carrying guns in public, right? Who's allowed to protect themselves and their community, what qualifies as, you know, worthy of protection. But the other thing that I want to highlight is, you know, if we have more people carrying firearms in public, right, who's going to be evaluated as potential dangers, potential threats, right? And so here now we have on the bottom, we have two people that were armed in separate Walmarts, right? On the left, we have John Crawford III. He has a gun in a Walmart. He gets shot and killed. On the right, we have Dmitry Arachenko. He goes into a Walmart fully armed and uh, ultimately is arrested. I'm, I forget exactly what happened to him, but nothing um, too serious. Um, importantly, John Crawford uh, the third on the left, the gun that he had was one that was for sale in Walmart, right? So he was actually just shopping and he gets called, somebody in the uh, Walmart calls, says there's a person here who is armed, right? Police come in, shoot him immediately. You can watch um, the video, though I don't necessarily recommend it, right? So here now we have again this idea of even if the Supreme Court says we all have this right to carry guns in public, to protect ourselves, protect our communities, how's that going to play out actually in real life? So, you know, 
if we shift, right, we've already seen police tend to, you know, focus on especially black men, right, but communities of color, over policing, they end up being the threat. So here, right, we have data showing that people in their implicit biases see black males specifically as larger, older, stronger, more dangerous, more associated with crime, right? So as we sort of shift into what I call privatizing policing, more people, right, citizens armed in public, these are the people, right, that are more likely to be shot, those who are already suffering most at risk. And then again, right, as you see down here on the left, we then have juries and judges and their biases evaluating, well, was this reasonable, right? I see a black guy and I also think he's very scary and dangerous. So seems reasonable to me that you would shoot him. So even on the back end, the ability to get justice is somewhat limited. And so when I'm thinking about, you know, what has reproductive justice taught us, part of it was, you know, this focus on abortion rights, when really the focus should be who has this right? Who can exercise this right? Who is protected and who is not, right? And importantly here, right, this, this quote I found to be really sort of telling, right, if we're, start, if we're thinking about reproductive justice and we're starting at the pregnancy, we're starting at the wrong place, right? So if we're thinking about a justice Fire, you know, firearms justice framework, right? if we're at the point where we're talking about a death, a gun disparity, right, or even a, uh, you know, a poor outcome for a jury trial, right, we're starting at the wrong place. And so, you know, using these lessons, I think we can uh, hopefully build sort of a more cohesive and holistic uh, movement going forward. Thank you.